Hello everybody, it's your old friends at Nerds Rose, and welcome back to the Best of All Worlds podcast here from your friends Jonathan and the man to know, Captain Jerry Soul. Um, we are back doing our timey-wimey stuff. Again, if you've heard this one before, it's probably because you almost certainly have. I do the same intro every fucking episode. But um, we are on a time arc, and we are going through the generations of the um, of what-ifs and hypotheses and hypotheticals. And uh, as we saw from the last episode, Jerry, we got a little bit of a scare. Well, I say we. You got a little bit of a scare over our previous entry, which was uh, from the from New Trek, and uh, namely the... Uh, the, perhaps one of the best episodes of Strange New World so far in the quality of Mercy. Now sharing the top spot with uh, In the Pale Moonlight. Have you sufficiently recovered from that? Because it was a bit of a shock. You, you, were, you were kind of a bit defeatist about your your boy being knocked off its perch. Now has it shared? It it wasn't knocked off its perch. It's still there. Now I have no doubt there are episodes coming that are like we're going to be going to ninety two, ninety three. I'd imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know about this this episode, but. Um, there's a there's a particular Voyager episode I think is is coming up very 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 soon. Um, we talked about a Deep Space Nine episode that's going to be coming up in in, in the coming months. Um, mm-hmm. that that will be my, I I think I think your your Voyager episode this this one particular episode I think will be the one to to knock, um, in the pale moonlight off its perch. Uh, but I I, I I have the perfect, I have the perfect thing. To challenge that, then, um, mm-hmm. because if you Which think I'm looking forward to as well, yeah, that that to me is probably one of the best, most action-packed episodes in all of Star Trek. Um, but for me, I, I I was very nervous as we were as we were um, um, scoring the last episode. Uh, I I was shit myself. I'm like, oh god, no, this is <laughs> this 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 is it. This is it. Um, thankfully, it only got equal to the top spot which mm. was fine which is fine by me well, I suppose, but, uh, like, if you wanted to say like that like i always kind of like you know when you all kind of have like a tie like this i was trying to look and wonder what's the kind of the, the discerning like difference between them and i'm even just looking at the scores because it's on screen for me at the moment like independent movie like has more tens than the quality of mercy has so you could argue if you had to pick one as top spot independent movie like is technically there by if you like goal difference but yeah. they're still sharing top spot either way. It's just it's uh, just the way that scoring works out. But um, but like I said, like it was a it was a it was a pleasant surprise that that new Trek uh, and indeed uh, Strange New Worlds uh, challenge and succeedly challenged the, um, the 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 top uh, top of the field. But we are not ending there because because we moved on from Strange New Worlds, we're literally moving up a generation to the uh, original series to uh, the ent- the crew of the Enterprise on the Kirk Spock et al. And uh, we're going with one of the. I think like with with we we've been very tactical as we said before with what episodes we have watched from the original series. We've tried to pick the best ones because there are a lot of them that are shite to be to be to be quite honest, and and they haven't aged well. And um, this one is often earmarked as one of the best ones of the original series. Like we've done a mug time, we've done Space Seed, we've done the Trouble with Tribbles, the Balance of Terror. They're the ones that a lot of people will remember as the really good episodes of the original series, where they kind of almost don't realise how good they have it. This one's now kind of come over the opposite side where you can clearly tell this is an excellent premise and an excellent idea for an episode. Whereas they've kind of had to dial it down to make it work. So um I've alluded to this a little bit and I kind of it's important to kind of set this up as to why this episode's a big deal. We're watching the city on the edge of forever, um, which is the 29th episode of this of the first season of Star Trek. Again, seasons weren't really a thing; they were just putting out an episode whenever they could. Um, but this is officially the 29th episode of Star Trek. Um, depending on production, like Marcus or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. That's the one we're we're marking with here. But it is the one and only episode that is technically written by Harlan Ellison. Um, you will know of Harlan Ellison from um, such works like I Have No Mouth and I'm the Scream uh, and various other um, science fiction where essentially he these are all like it's, it's a lot of cosmic horrors it's a lot of um, technological horrors because he's a well known um, technophobe and he is he's very much the inspiration of something like Black Mirror is now where like Charlie Brooker would have read a lot of Harlan Ellison when he was growing up and the kind of like the, there's a kind of internal paranoia about how humans are going to fuck everything up eventually and that's what kind of Harlan Ellison is essentially he is that kind of like proven that like 
oh yeah no we fucked it up you know um, so like he has written like science fiction for about 40 years which is incredible um, so like again I've No Mouth is one of the famous short stories you've got Dangerous Visions you've got The Beast That Shouted Love at the Heart of the World all these long winded titles um, they're all short stories you know and um, but uh, but he was asked to well I wouldn't say he was asked to, but he was he was prompted to to write a script for Star Trek, mm-hmm. um, and what basically followed was him writing a Harlan Ellison story, but it was very fucking dark. Um, unfortunately, it was too dark for Star Trek, and um, so when we get to the end of the episode, I'll point out the kind of the um, the invitations. But the actual story beats are still there. So in essence, this is a Harlan Ellison episode, but it's done. With, it's been diluted and washed down quite a bit to make it acceptable for for, for Gene Roddenberry's yeah. like um, glorious socialist utopia vision. So um, so with that in mind, we're gonna get started because, uh, like I said, this is the the cream of the crop when it comes to the original series. But we will see if it holds up. Jerry Soul, with your limited um, knowledge of uh, the original series. Have you heard of the episode "The Edge of City on the Edge of Forever"? I, I have. I have heard of it. I know it's a timey wimey thing. I, I know of the uh, being or entity that uh, controls the the time and, and whatnot, because yes. you you actually see that particular uh, entity in uh, Discovery. Mm-hmm. It's back back in Discovery. Um, I have heard of it. I, I've never seen it. Um, I was just looking at the description. Mm. And I was quite surprised by the description because it's all about Dr. McCoy. Yes. And I'm like, oh, well, that's different. It is different. Uh, so, yes, I, I'm very interested. I'm intrigued, actually, to see exactly how this goes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because I have been pleasantly surprised by a lot of the episodes that we we'll watch from the original series because they've been so good. Mm-hmm. Um, now, obviously, a lot of them aren't, aren't, aren't are shit. But at the end of the day, you could look at a lot of Next Gen, a lot of Deep Space Nine, a lot of Voyager for yeah. shite episodes. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. They're not, they're I mean, not they're all good. There's a, there's, there's, yeah. a re- there's a reason we're not watching every single episode of Star Trek, because if we did, we'd be bored out of our fucking minds. Exactly. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm intrigued to watch this. I'm looking forward to this. Um, and, and even more so because of the description, because I'm like, I thought this was just a typical, it's got to be Kirk and Spock type of thing. The fact that it says McCoy, I'm like, oh. Okay, let's mm. let's let's see where let's see where this goes. I say yeah, I, I I can see the actually episode description there. I'm thinking like, oh wow, they have actually given nothing away in that box, in that description. I like it. So yeah, let's let's jump right in because again, you're much like much like a, a, a quality of mercy. You're coming in blind, so let's see how this works. And um, so as I've said countless times on this uh, show, but I'll say it anyway, just for for newcomers. If you are wanting to watch along this episode with us, you can pick your streaming uh, choice, uh, your, your streaming service of choice, and you can basically press play when we do, and we can give you the kind of our, our own commentary as we're watching the episode along with it. If you don't want that, you can skip to the actual review of the episode because again, this is the best of all worlds. It's watch along and review all in one happy two hour video. Um, but uh, if you are inclined, by all means, watch along with us. If not. Give us about 50 minutes and we'll get into the uh, trivia and the uh, episode review itself. But for those watching along, Jerry, are you ready to start? Ready to go. All right, then. On the count of three, then. Three, two, one. Engage. You can barely see the strings. <laughs> oh, the, the updated graphics are just fantastic. It just adds, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it just takes the takes away so much, like... Mm, very ominous start. Yes. Start as you mean to go on. <laughs> Everyone's struggling there and like Kirk is going, I don't know. You might want to sort your life out, lads. Understood engineer. Arsehole, Kirk. I get, I get the feeling he may have lost a bet or something. To Scotty. Nope. I'm 
<laughs> He's fine. He knows you're just serious because they all have the soft lighting when they're being good guys. Oh. So that wasn't meant to happen. Yeah, flailing. So yes, that's one of the sorry side effects of the cordial scenes that it's in, in the wrong hands, it's a massive hallucinogen, as you can imagine. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, McCoy I is want gone. some of that shit. Yeah, he's gone now on a drug-infused rampage. Wow. And, and yeah, so how's that for an, for an episode opener? <laughs> it, it, it starts in... Uh, ship, ship looked like it under attack. Yeah. Um. You've then got... The explosions inside. You get Sulu nearly getting exploded. Mm -hmm. Um, McCoy has now been Cordrazine, uh, poisoned. Yep. And what, we're, what, we're in like what, what, yeah. we're not even in two minutes. Yeah, that's it. The episode hasn't actually started. That is just the premise. Jesus. <laughs> Two red shows on the wrong in the corridor. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> 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 you know, chop. <laughs> you know, chop with trumpets. This is quite accurate for some drugs, by the way, because it triggers the, the fight or flight uh, part of the brain. Mm. You remember Lieutenant Kyle, the original one? Mm-hmm. It's only one thing they tighten up with in uh, later uh, Star Trek is that like it isn't always the captain that goes out on these things mm. because why would you ever take that security risk? Yeah. But I'm like, Ahura is down there. I was like, why is Ahura down there? Yeah, you might need a communications officer, someone to translate. You never know. I mean, you got Scotty there to maybe fix something. You got two red shirts as a sacrificial lambs. It makes complete sense. Mm. And the Spock's, the Spock figures out everything with his magic little box. It looks like an old Western set. I really like the, the vibe yeah. of it. 
And they always do this with like um sandy or desert type sets. They always put this like extra silica on to make it look alien. Mm. Small thing, but it just catches your eye when you're watching. But Spock. Like this is a giant rock. I love it. It's just... I I really wanted like yeah going to annoy certain people on on online by just having a screen cap of him popping out from the rocks and just go vaccinated question mark. Yeah. <laughs> the chicken or the egg. Wow, sassy and poetic. I like it. God, he'd want to get what his fucking they... glasses on, wouldn't he? For Jesus' sake! They... You imagine they like hear the heavy panting that man must be having. <laughs> Just Edge comes out from the fucking portal. <laughs> you think you know me? <laughs> yeah, I'm at a Ringo. I'm a 95. <laughs> ah, he's a squirrely one, that McCoy. Yeah, you don't have to give it a couple of minutes. We're still in the fucking bed. Uh... There you go. Seems the speed at which yesterday passes. I was made to honor the past. There's war. Do it. Lose oneself. Century was willing to stay with no man. Have you tried the batteries, Aurora? That sound you're hearing is a butterfly effect occurring in real time. I'm 
<laughs> Drama. <laughs> Where exactly is he recording that? Well, on his tricorder, I presume. You've asked the Guardian to show us Earth's history again. Clark and I will go back into time ourselves and attempt to set right whatever it was that McCoy changed. <laughs> so when does the stock footage when does the stock footage loop again? Around the time of Ben Hur. Okay. Again, this is a really good plan. Like, Captain Zone often do kind of jump in bollock first here and not have an actual plan. Hmm. We are successful. There is no option. Boom. Da, 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 da. Scotty thinking, ooh, maybe I could lead the Scots against the Brits. Hmm. <laughs> I like that the uh, the stock footage is a very is a clue to where they're going. Yeah. And then the first thing you see is the poster. <laughs> Good instinct there, Spock. Considering like what they had at the time, like the set is actually quite impressive. Extremely accurate. Yeah. You're talking it's only about twenty, twenty five years, really. Hmm. Yeah, so if, if you're if this was done in nineteen sixty seven, I wanna say. Hmm. Nineteen sixty seven, Jerry. So if you're going by the Great Depression, there's a thirty year gap. Yeah. So again, not too far away. Again, it's like it's like putting the like like us doing something in the eighties, in the nineties. You know? Not that oh, far God. away. Though. You're making me feel so old. I know, I know. I just did the same thing myself. Huh? Is he going to be an Irish stereotype? No. 
<laughs> Obviously. <laughs> There's more people gathering. <laughs> Sketch. <laughs> so in case it hasn't been explained just yet, they are actually in New York City in the nineteen thirties. Um, I, saw the, I saw Madison Square Garden, so I said, yeah, that must be where I know they are. haven't explicitly said it yet, but yeah, they are, they're supposed to be in New York. Um, mainly because the episode title is actually how New York was described. It's a city on the edge of forever, because it's, it's on the sea. The more you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh the back and forty two had are tremendous. I think this is the uh, first official time in human history that a Vulcan has worn jeans. Yeah. What a wonderful world we live in. <laughs> I love that he says that as an insult. Zinc. Ugh. Soft lighting. Fifteen cents an hour. Nineteen thirty, Jerry. Remember? <laughs> there we go for the nice gritty realism that did actually happen around the time it's one of the few times where Star Trek and Real Series their social commentary is actually kind of accurate and not ham-fisted whatsoever like that's just, like it's just grim it's just all these old men in tattered clothes because none of them can they don't have any money they're all done this whole fucking generation of people wiped out. It's 
mad. Man is going to be able to harness incredible energy, maybe even an atom. In fairness, nuclear energy was a thing around this time. Mm -hmm. Of course you do, you dirty old bollocks. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And now it's time for a Kirk sexual conquests in space. Said this one technically isn't in space. It's in time. It's totally different. You can see he's using the old. It, it, it's hard. It's hard to tell where the Kirk ends and the Shatner starts. It's all in the eyes. It really is, yeah, isn't it? Like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. Oh fucking hell! <laughs> Out of the way, you pretentious bollockses. Ah, you dirty old man and dirty beards, dirty asses. Just a simple level salad. No, today's been the day to see it. I do have, I have 45 pints in about two hours. <laughs> two hours. <laughs> Sick of applause. Whoop! <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, let me just fucking magic that one up. Sketch, sketch. Put the hat on. Contraptions.
Honesty is the best policy. <laughs> Even for a Vulcan, Spock just looks fucking dumb. Let's steal them. Charm. <laughs> He's just wafting the pheromones just towards her. It's like, come on, come on, take. <laughs> but going, is she really good or someone's fucking with us? But Spock, if I unbutton the next bit of my shirt, do you think it'll work? <laughs> Seems logical, Captain. Oh, 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 here we go. Spoilers at some stage in this conversation, no? <laughs> and now Spock is in his happy place. Uh oh. Oh, nearly there. Oh. 
I know. This is why you need arts, people. Mm -hmm. This is why you don't fall in love, Kirk. It's the hope that Kirk kills never you. falls in love, he just rides. No, no, I think he's falling in love this time, Jerry. This one's for real. Not even Carol yeah. Marcus is taking that box. <laughs> Good old fashioned dog. Ah, oh, sneaky boy. Don't take another man's milk. I know it's the Great Depression, but come on, you have to have standards. Uh. <laughs> he has had a bad day. Mm -hmm. Aww. Poor boys, really, they're re really spooked. Normally when you hear someone saying, I won't kill you, don't run. What is so untrustworthy about that? Fucking knows. Mm. <laughs> Wild eyes. Bald. <laughs> we should also say, like, the, it is a common thing in the in the original series to do parallel Earths, as they call it, mm -hmm. where they'll go to a planet. It's same as Earth, except something has happened. Like the Romans are still in charge, or mm -hmm. the Nazis are around, or something like that. You know.
attack some people like Thomas Peter's <laughs> Just check with him. Uh oh. What's he got there? Oh, God. Yeah. He just phasered himself to death. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hell. How about that? Huh? <laughs> How's that for trauma? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just so dusty. <laughs> There's a little cup of tea now, wouldn't you, there, uh, Jerry? I'm, I'm grand with what I have. I'm sure you are. And that's definitely not tea, it's coffee. It is coffee, yes. <laughs> I love the, the motion there. It's just like, oh. Oh, Jim, 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 Jim. Oh, dear. Jim, 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 Jim. So the conundrum is now, save the woman you love, or let nature or let history take its course.
I see we're all going through the drug hangover here now, uh, McCoy, huh? <laughs> the smug blink says it all. It's all listenation. You're all weird. Times like this where you fully acknowledge McCoy would have been a Republican. <laughs> Unless that's fine. You know, he, he can do what he wants. No. <laughs> <laughs> I presume it's Fox just goes room just go oh oh shit no he would have done the old fashions You know, you're already making the decision easier, Spock, you know? Like, just saying. Oh, don't you even try to be the charmer now. Inspecting conspiracy theories for two weeks, and now suddenly you're all fine. Bullshit. Well, technically injected, but you know what I mean. It took two. Oh, the plot thickens. <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> oh, Kirk, be careful. He goes to late World War Two for two years by doing that. Oh. Oh. 
Uh oh. Ah. Oh. And that's yeah, that's that uh, that's how it's over. And he does actually get the writing credit, to to be fair. Mm. There was a lot of rewrites, but he does technically get the credit for it, Carl Ellison. But there you go. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. So that, there was a lot going on in that episode. An, aw just... an, aw an awful lot going on. Yes. It was a, quite a bit. <laughs> um, it's... I think it's the only original series episode that I can remember that doesn't do the happy sign off. Mm. You know, where they, all the lads are on the bridge and they all like chat about the episode and sign off with a, a witty like one liner from one of the three people or Scotty being a, being Scottish. No, no, this was a genuine like, oh no, we're not celebrating this. Like we yeah. we've yeah. nothing to celebrate here, you know. And I think it's actually quite unique in that respect. I don't remember another episode that that signed off the same way and um, in a way like again it's not it's not an optimistic episode of star trek as we as we are trained to expect especially from this uh from this time where it is pure roddenberry vision of the world where everyone gets along fine and stuff but because it was an ellison episode um and in a way like it's more realistic to, than uh than the way roddenberry would write his characters um because naturally there's a there's, there's a clash between the three guys here you know mainly yeah. because like you can imagine that there has been a massive argument between McCoy and Kirk after all this and it is solely because um it's solely because like like they like McCoy has a set of information Kirk has a different set of information and they just aren't they can't uh, essentially work away work around it you know but they haven't they, like it's still raw by the time we see the episode end I'm sure it's fine by the next episode, but that's all the whole point is that, like, you know, that we don't poke the bear here. You don't want to fucking, like, hear what's going to happen here. So, to actually kind of give you the, the outline of what the episode as Ellis and as Ellison wanted it to be. So, um, so as I said, the actual um, the episode title does actually refer to New York City itself. Um, because essentially he was going to, um, when Kirk goes back in time, he's going to basically see the city built as it was basically like a a uh, as a as a city on the kind of waterfront and he he call it he call it the city on the edge of forever mm. but uh the initial script is actually supposed to be chicago not new york but um oh, okay but that's the way it, that's the way it was uh it was it was intended but um but yeah it was um the original actually outline so we obviously saw mccoy accidentally get hit with the with the cordrazine that's what kind of turns him loopy but the original story actually had a crewman called beckwith um, who is on the Enterprise um, and was meant to be featured in an episode or two before this to introduce him was going to be revealed to be dealing drugs among the crew 
um, and not only that then but he also uh, murders a fellow crewman called Lebec and just as about he was going to get caught he escapes the planet and goes through the time vortex um, and the, the race is called are called the, God, the Guardians hence why you have Guardians of Forever um, then instead of the Enterprise um, disappearing completely as we saw in that uh, kind of butterfly effect it's replaced by pirates called the Condor and again all the other like every person on the on the ship are pirates they're not actual humans or they are humans but they're not um it's kind of the, the mirror universe setup essentially mm. um and then kirk and spock they follow um they follow back through time and the story kind of plays out from there essentially um and uh yeah like the 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 name of the character was different instead of like it was originally either kessler um because it was supposed to be a german surname um, but they turned it to Keeler because it's supposed to be a combination of killer and healer. That's the whole. Um, that was the whole premise with the, the the wordplay with the surname. Again, because she is that kind of focal point between. Like she is a healer, but solely for just like her circumstances, she does cause a lot of like in a completely inadvertently complete butterfly effect thing. She has no control over it. But um, like there's the very some very clever little instructions in that. Now, obviously, that whole like that's one thing. The other story outline was that. The death penalty is still in in, in Starfleet in Ellison's um, story, so Beckman is going to be sentenced to death. Kirk would order his execution, um, and there'd be a firing squad onto in the Guardian planet. All, all this stuff was obviously just fucking wow. completely scrapped. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, in the and then in the revised script, Ellison goes, "Okay, fine, I'll take out the firing squad." But he does escape from Spock this time, tries to use the time vortex again, and ends up getting trapped in a time loop, and that's what kills him over and over again. It's like. Okay, no, we can't do that either. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like the but like Ellison, like the characterization was all wrong as well because like Kirk was like very much like racist, and Spock was also being kind of racist as well. And um, I think Ellison's kind of point was probably that like oh they've gone like to an age of barbarism by their by their worldview, which is I suppose technically correct. I mean, when you're coming from a utopia to a Great Depression, you think it is barbarism because it's like there's no socialism, there's no um, social equality, gender equality, anything like this, you know. Um, and then you have the drug use and all this sort of stuff, and like they're like they're clearly not going to fly in a Roddenberry world. So this is essentially you can see where the dilution happens, particularly with like the with McCoy standing in as the uh, as the accidental addict, if you like. Um, no murderers, nothing like that. And instead of having this kind of like uh, this social commentary with uh, with Kirk and Spock, kind of like you know, f like being snobs about the Great Depression, you get this love story instead, where Kirk essentially has to f like pick head over heart. And I think that makes for a better story overall, especially for Star Trek, you know, mm. because as it were, it takes it away from Ellison a little bit and becomes its own thing. And amongst the original series, it's a brilliant piece um, that like still holds up today. Uh, but whether it's um, a good enough for us now is another question. So, while we before we get to the interview or to the review, um, I will give you the guest stars of this episode. Thankfully, quick enough one this time around, because mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of one and dones. However, I'm going to start off with something fun here, um, because we're going to talk to tell tell you about uh, Jimmy Bartel Larue or Bart LaRue to his friends. Um, so he was actually the voice of um, oh. the Guardian of Forever. He is, the, he is the voice there, and he is his voice is used quite a lot then over um, over time then, so you'll hear it again in Discovery and Terra Firma. Um, but he is a voice actor for many things in the original series. Um, so in fact, uh, and he, you do actually see him twice in the original series too, physically. So again, I'm not expecting you to know these, Jerry, but I will tell you he appears six times in the original series, and um, oh, yes. four as voices and two as um, as himself. So um, and again, there's also, it's, it's almost like a weird kind of pattern to his to his roles in a sense. And um, the I think one of the few one of the episodes before this was the episode called The Squire of Gothos, which is um, Trelane, the Trelane episode where. Clearly, that's the like a, a baby Q essentially, act, like acting the Mickey with uh, with the Enterprise crew, and uh, Bart Larue here is the voice of his father. So you could argue he is actually a Q, 
um, he's voicing a Q there. Mm-hmm. Um, then you have the Guardian voice and uh, City Edge of Forever. The other two voice acting roles, um, he is in the game series of Triskelion. He is one of the kind of the provider voices, which basically is kind of like red orbs that are, um, they basically kidnap um, Kirk or Hora Chekhov and get them to play and um, kind of these weird, like, fucking, uh, like, uh, gambles. It's actually the I believe that's the episode where um, they have the interracial kiss. I could be wrong. Oh, um, yeah. I, I can't remember if it was that episode or the one um, that was kind of the sequel to that. Um, the other voice he does as well is the Savage Curtain which you will know because of the, um, this is the Abraham Lincoln episode. Oh, okay. Where um, you see Abraham Lincoln and uh, uh, Genghis Khan and all these other people are brought onto the same planet and um, and essentially he plays the kind of the inorganic mass that uh that appears as the uh as the orchestrator of it all he's a uh, yarnik who i believe is an excalbian i think so he's an inorganic being that's that's thrown onto this as well and um, so he's only the voice he doesn't actually play the the the, the, the poor fucker has to carry around the, the big shell and um, but he does appear physically in in the original series twice and um, hilarious enough in two very similar episodes the first one is as in the in the episode Bread and Circuses, and that is uh, I mentioned the, earlier about the parallel Earth episodes. Mm-hmm. So this one is where basically an Earth like an Earth style civilization has developed at the same time as us. The one deviation is that the Roman Empire prevails and continues on to our equivalent of the twentieth century. So Bread and Circuses, he's the actually the announcer for the TV version of Gladiators, and um, where which. Um, as prisoners, McCoy, Spock, and and Kirk have to fight it out as actual gladiators, and it's the TV combat is purely for sports. So he's the announcer in that, and it's very you can actually you can tell his voice. It's very it's very distinctive. And um, similarly, he is also in the episode Patterns of Force. So again, another parallel third episode just replaced the Romans with the Nazis. Um, and he is the new ca- newscaster on that. And again, they they don't pull punches. Everyone's wearing swastikas and they're wearing the SS uniforms. They are they're properly like this is a this is a parallel um, Earth if the Nazis prevailed. Um, and he is a newscaster, basically speaking on behalf of the regime. And again, you'll see him in the doing the doing the role physically as well. But um, I thought I'd throw that in because like he is as a voice in some really important episodes. But also really typecasted as well. It's really strange. Mm. It's because he obviously has such a fucking amazing voice that like no matter whenever they had needed a like a like big booming fucking like Father Ted esque, do you need an exciting exuberant voice? That's the guy you call. And uh, <laughs> and they called him six times as a result. And um, you would probably see him in other shows around the time as well, like Mission Impossible and the Brady Bunch. You'll probably recognize him from there as well. And um, but in terms of his voice acting roles, he, he was he died at the age of fifty seven, um, in uh, in the year nineteen ninety. And again, for for Star Trek, he will forever be known as a Guardian Forever, uh, amongst his other roles. And um, a few other one and dones then to speak of. Um, we have the policeman, who thankfully wasn't an Irish stereotype like every other fucking policeman in American shows at that time. And um, he was played by Hal Baylor who uh, was, uh, I believe, uh, yes, he was Texan, sorry, but he was, um, he was, uh, funny enough, a boxer before becoming an actor, would you believe? Um, again, it's always fascinating reading the kind of the, the, the timelines of these people um, when, like, war, like, like the mid, so we say, wartime, uh, like, lifetime, like, life, well, lives during wartime, that's what I was trying to say, because he was a boxer, Joined the Marines, and then when the war is over, it became an actor. Like that's <laughs> it's just three diametrically different things. Like it's it's gas, and um, not many roles to speak of. To be fair, and um, he does a lot of guest roles. And um, I think like the, as an actor, he gets two hundred movie roles, all guest stars, all these different slots. And um, the uh, most probably the most prominent movie was The Setup, which was uh, obviously availing. It's a boxing movie, so naturally, he's 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 hired as a boxer. Um, and he's also in a few other movies as well, but um, yeah, in terms of so Star Trek, he is just the, the policeman that gets uh, the Vulcan nerve pinch, and um, that's what you ever have in a dirty uniform, I guess. Um, next up then is uh, David Ross, who uh, is still alive, still going today, would you believe, at the age of 84. Um, so he appears as two different red shirts um, in Star Trek, but his most reoccurring role is what we see in this one as uh, Galloway. Um, funny enough, we actually have already seen him technically 
um, because he was in the tri- he was in um, the Trouble with Tribbles episode. Um, however, he was not given a name at that stage. So as a crewman, he's now called Galloway, which is hilarious enough then because I think in season two or three, he's called Johnson. So clearly you have like two doppelgangers they look exactly the same and end yeah. up dying um, and again very much uh, like as we mentioned with a lot of these actors at the time they all appear in the same type of shows like The Man From U.N.C.L.E. and um, McMillan and Wife is another one he's in and Combat is another one of his um, but he appears in a couple of episodes actually as Galloway um, and but again Trouble Tribble The City of the Desert Forever um, Galileo 7 uh, the Omega Glory, so he appears quite a bit as a, as himself in a, in a sense. But uh, yep, yeah, as I said, it's, it's a minor role in, in a sense because red shirts be red shirts. And um, next up then is the only person I could actually say plays two uh, two roles in Star Trek, um, a man by the name of John Harmon. So John Harmon was um, the, uh, the the down and out that talked to the guys and ended up phasering himself uh, in the most glorious fashion. And um, enough in the script he was called Rodent. That was his name. Um, and yeah, maybe carry over from uh, from Harlan Ellison, I think. Um, but he also appears in another Parallel Earth episode, um, which is, I believe, I want to say, a piece of the action. Um, and this was one where essentially it's a mafia world as opposed to uh, mm-hmm. anything else. So it's, again, it's if the Al Capones of the world prevailed and became part of the culture. So he plays one of the the, the gangsters called Teppo. Um, and again, very distinct. He has a very distinctive face in a sense. He can't quite hide it. It's very like uh, uh, kind of that kind of Rowan Atkinson effect of it, where very rubbery and malleable. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, um, he starts. He started off his career um, in the 90- in the sixties and was in fucking everything. Um, Three hundred movie roles to his credits, um, wow. including TV guest TV work as well. And um, Wild West, Land of the Giants, Book Rogers. He start he his film credits include Book Rogers from 1939, so that's how long he had been Jesus, going. Jesus, yeah. Uh, in fact, I think I would believe, yeah. So he starts off in Book Rogers in 1939, and his last role was Mr. Lipschitz in The Naked Monster in 2005. Can hell. And bear in mind that was shot ten years um, before the film came out. He had been dead for those ten years. <laughs> Which probably tells you that maybe that movie took a little bit too long in the oven. But um but Just yeah, a little he, bit. Yeah, just just a small bit. But like you said, a lot of prominent film roles, a lot of uh those proverbial guest stars that you that you need and you're looking for. Um and yeah, just uh just uh, someone who like a career actor and you can't say fair than that. So then we get to the big one. Um the really the most prominent uh, character in the show is uh yeah. is Eve Keeler sister eve the killer should be precise because she is a she she is a religious person uh, as you as it came across but she is played by uh, dame joan collins um who is an english actor the i think she was put on trying to put on the american one but the the accent was very strong you couldn't really hide yeah. it i i um, always get her mixed up with, with elizabeth taylor i don't know what it is i think the two of them kind of came up at the same time they did but i but, I, but I, I always get her mixed up with elizabeth taylor i was like i was going to say ah yeah elizabeth no no shit 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 no, shit shit definitely not, no but like well i can see why i can see why you think that because they're also in very similar um kind of works as well um but like the like john collins um she's still going today she's 90 um at the moment jo- hold on john collins is still alive john collins is still alive yes yes she is oh uh, for- I, I i am fucking googling that now yeah, there you go now. Um, I think she's still working, as far as I know. Yes, she is. Um, her most recent work was in the short *The Gentle Sex*, and she actually plays Major Connie Brown in it, 2022. And um, she was also in again recently, *Benidorm*, *The Royals*, and um, *American Horror Story*. Who are who I She was in own. *Benidorm*. She's in *Benidorm*. Yeah, Crystal oh, Hennessy Bass. Yeah. Christ Almighty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm just, I'm just looking at a recent picture over here. Yeah. For someone who's ninety years of age, she actually doesn't look half bad. She actually no, looks really she well. Does not. Absolutely does not. But like an absolutely legendary fucking actress. Absolutely legendary actor. Um again, the fact that like her career started in the in, in starting in mid fifties, so she's already ten years in, in in experience by the time she gets to this. Mm. Um and again, a lot of movies like The Virgin Queen, The Road to Hong Kong, um, and then you have just 
everything else on top of that. Like she's in two episodes of Batman, the original series, Mission Impossible, The Virginian. Um, the, then you have, I suppose like what people will know her now uh, from this point on, shall we say, 1981, Alexis Carrington in Dynasty. That is like, you could say, you could Dynasty make an is the big one, her yeah. biggest role, yeah. you yeah. know? Um, and again, you can also kind of see where like uh, the, the, uh, um, you can also see where the kind of the, kind of the seminaries of Elizabeth Taylor is as well, because of similar backgrounds and upgrades as well. Mm-hmm. And here's enough. Here's some small world syndrome for you, Jerry. There was a TV movie movie made about Dynasty called A Making of a Guilty Pleasure, and Joan Collins was played by Alex Krieg. What? Yeah. How's that for small world syndrome? Jesus, that's mental. Yeah. And uh, again. She was also she was on a part of a Cinzano um, advertising campaign on British TV, and who did she who was she featuring alongside in that ad? Marina Sirtis. Oh, for small world syndrome, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. Um, but like I said, like you will, you know Joan Collins by face, you know her by her roles, and um, I'm doing it the service by just leaving it at what she has done because there's so many fucking things like. My goodness, it's it is a hell of a career. As I said, I mentioned Dynasty. That that is a, a an institution in its own right. You've got um, what else am I looking at here? Like she was in uh, let's see, a lot of the British works as well. Will and Grace. Um, she was in for a feature as well. Um, I think I saw Hotel Babylon for Butler's Wives. Um, Rules of Engagement. Like a lot of the kind of like a, a good mix of American and uh, and and British shows. And um, she even made it to Starsky and Hutch. Would you believe? Um, like she's in, a, she was in so many things. It's an absolutely incredible career, uh, and rightfully so. A uh, tremendous actor, and uh, well worth the money uh, in this episode. It's fair to say. So that's all the guest stars. No special ships to, to speak about unless you count the Guardian Forever, which we don't. Um, not a fucking chance because they ain't going anywhere. So now it's time for our review. And um, I've done the talking, Jerry. You have seen this episode for the first time. Yes. Um, with very little to go on, as I said. We had a bit of a box blurb. We have whatever it is. Um, I'd like to see what you thought of the plot, how it started, how it developed, and how it ended. What, what did you think of the plot? I, I wasn't expecting it to go the, the way it went. You know, you, you're thinking timey-wimey. They've gone back and, and uh, they, they, they have to, to save the universe because uh, Dr. McCoy has done something and I said to myself I, I, I didn't know I didn't know what this episode was so I said, oh maybe this is the one with the Nazis and they go back in time and, and all of a sudden the Nazis have taken over everywhere um, and essentially essentially that is what happens we just don't see it yeah um, that, that that's, is that's part of the butterfly we just don't see it so I wasn't uh, I wasn't prepared really for, for what we actually got I'm actually quite surprised um, I, I I was expecting uh, an action-packed episode, mm. um, but we got a more intriguing story than yeah. just simply an action-packed episode. Um, it was I don't, I don't really know how to describe it. It, it was good. I I did like it. Um, it. It's just not what I was expecting at all. Mm. Uh, but again, pleasantly surprised. Quite good. The the story was good. Well, we listen. We'll get into it. But uh, yeah, very. Uh, I was happy enough with that episode. Um, it. Uh, I, I I have I have a pick for best scene already, and uh, uh, yeah, it it was it was it was good. I, I but it just wasn't what I was expecting. As again, I I was expecting like action packed, maybe fighting and whatnot going on, but uh, the. The most amount of action we saw was McCoy going mental on the planet. Um, mm. So uh, I, I, I was just expecting different, not more, not better, different. Um, but I was happy with what we got. So yeah, that was very interesting, very very interesting. Yeah. Like even even with the dilution from the original, like Harlan Ellison, like you know, paranoid fucking ramblings that he normally does. I don't, I'm, I'm a fan of his work, in fairness. I'm not denigrating it, but like even this as it is now is still a very un Star Trek like episodes and I know like the, like again this is like this all uncharted territory for them and we say this every single time you watch an episode especially in the first season they don't know what's good yet they don't know 
whether the balance of terror is good or the one where they're half white and half black is good yet they are still finding it all out for themselves like where like again and now that we're looking at it back from like what like 60 years later 70 years later whatever it is like we can now say oh no like this is this is one of their best ones but they don't know that at the time they don't know whether they're where they're coming or going with this series and um, and of course, like the, the PV, like audiences are different as well. You know, this might not have worked in 1964, but now it does because of how of how well it is. And I, I'd say the one thing as well, like it's like I have a lot of positives in the plot for this one. And it is mainly because the changes that are made to make it more like a Star Trek episode, I think, are better than what was in the original script. Because if you do throw in stuff like drug addicts and serial killers and executions and capital punishment, that just it would look so fucking wrong compared to yeah. the rest of the series, you know? Like, even those basic things are set... That, that stall is already set out. Whereas, like, Roddenberry is talking... Is writing from the view of a twenty of the 23rd century when everything is fixed. Whereas Harlan Ellison is still stuck in the Vietnam War. And the Americans are assholes. You're assholes. You're assholes. We're all assholes. And, you know, he's writing it from that point of view, which is fine. But like I said, if you want to write for Star Trek, you have to adapt and you have to make it right. And I think they have done that. Again, the, the actual central hook of, like, is Cap- Captain Kirk having to realise that the woman that he does genuinely love, and it isn't the fucking fleeting thing, this is an emotional connection, that he has to give this woman up at, the, like, the one time he actually finds her, you know, and and has to give it up for the sake, for the, for the sake of... Uh, of the timeline of the like planet, he, of he, he's not just giving her up. He he is. Uh, he has to watch her die. Yeah, that's you know? even that's even the most that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's a really strong plot, Jerry. I have to say, I think the way it unraveled, unfurled, everything I think was excellent. I'm pushing for a nine to ten on this one. I think it's for a strong the, for, plot for for the plot. Yeah. Oh, it's a ten. So because oh, it's oh, it's a ten. You're going for ten. Okay. Oh, absolutely. I thought it was a very strong plot. Uh, because it really the 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 uh, description really throws you. It really, really does because you you don't expect, um, you don't expect that. For, you're looking at the description, you think it's just about McCoy. So you think mm. this is a very McCoy centric episode, kind of like how uh, Next Gen and, and and Deep Space Nine did it. Is that the, it's around a particular character, whereas yes, that was the case, but it was still centralized around uh, Kirk McCoy. So you don't expect it. So there was a lot of twists and turns in this. Um, I love the fact that that we're in. Um, it was almost present day at the time. You know, mm. 25, 30 years in the difference, but it wouldn't have changed all that much. Um, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I thought the plot was fantastic. So it's a definite ten for me. Definite. Yeah, 10. yeah. I think I think we're happy with that then. Um, and next, another uh, positive category for me is the settings. And um, again, like it's it, this is this was a bit of a blowout in terms of the budget because they they traveled, they did a lot of fucking sets, they did a lot of um, a lot of different um, stuff. Again, not all of it was on a spaceship, not all of it was on a stage. You know, a good bit of interiors, a lot of um, a lot of stuff that it was intended to get you into this into the year nineteen thirty. Like I mentioned at the time, the first thing you're seeing as they travel back is the Madison Square Garden poster. And it's a genuine poster as well. It's not a fake one. That is a genuine poster from that time. And that is deliberate. It's intended to say, this is where we are. This is what time the audience will see it before Kirk and Spock do. In fact, they don't even recognize it. They don't even acknowledge it. You know, that is strictly for us. And I admire that level of subtlety. And I admire also the subtlety of like, here's the soup kitchen. Here's the... The, the flop as they say and it's all these different things and just every time you come back to Spock he's added more fucking gizmos to his contraption very small things like that it just adds a lot to every scene um, and yeah granted like it looks for New York it looks fucking massively wide like it doesn't look like like yeah, because it's on a set and it's on a, a stage it makes New York look like fucking um, wide and massive but it gets the point across, you know. It it, it doesn't uh, slide on that. But it's, I think it's a strong category as well uh, on this one. Um, what what did you think of the setting? Like you like again, we I, always I, have to gauge it differently based on the time this came out. I I enjoyed it. Um, I, I, when we first see New York, um, it's still very much kind of in in, in its infancy. Mm. Um, it's it's clearly not Manhattan. It's not it's it's but it but they're not making it out to be Manhattan. It is more. It seems like more Brooklyn Bronx is what I would exactly. Kind of think. It's not so, metropolitan so, anymore. 
Exactly. Somewhere outside the main city, uh, it doesn't have any high rise or anything in it yet. You do mm. see the Brooklyn Bridge and you do see some skyscrapers, but uh, in, in terms of the episode, they're far away. Um, I, but I thought the, the, the old time look uh, was fantastic. Um, like even a, a, anything from like the, the, the soup kitchen was fantastic. The basement uh, mm. looked fantastic. Even their flop. Like I, I was half expecting it to turn into a fucking um, uh, like a sitcom. That's how it yeah, looked. The way the camera's positioned. Yeah, the way it was positioned. Was, yeah. it, was, it was like a sitcom. I was like, this is actually fantastic. I, this is absolutely brilliant. Um, it, it's a strong one uh, uh, again because it was very area, uh, air, sorry, not area, <laughs> era specific. Mm. Very, very era specific. I think they got it. They nailed it. Um, everything from the sets to the costumes to uh, the people uh, in it. It, it, it. This is a nine or a ten for me. Yeah, I'm. I was gonna say nine. Personally. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go uh, with nine then. So yeah, I think yeah, uh, like I said, it, it's they done what they can with uh, with again. They, I think the one thing you would probably say is in terms of visual language, it is quite bright. You know, like there's a lot. It's all it's very clear blue sky and whatever it is. Again, you could always make that point where like if it's a Great Depression go for overcast make it gloomy or make it more depressing whatever it is do do more at night or whatever like that's nitpicking at that stage but like i'm also kind of thinking like well we gave tens for like you know doing the right lighting and mood and atmosphere for certain episodes it's only fair that we do keep a bit of consistency as well like they've thrown in the, the enough subtlety in this episode that it's like you're you're getting a nine either way this is good this is a good score but um but like i said you're you're, you're still getting points either way um Again, another really fucking positive. I've got nothing but positive in this episode, Jerry, but this one is perhaps one of the biggest ones, the writing. Um, Fantastic. Absolutely. Like, it It just... When you have a character-driven episode, uh, the writing is fucking paramount. Pardon the pun. Paramount to it being that could be an important episode. And because it is essentially leading up to the moral dilemma of uh, of what Kirk has again it's a head over heart principle it's having to accept that like he needs to let her go and he needs to put the the will of the many against the needs of the few and he knows this we know this but it's still going to break his heart nonetheless um and it's it's also the fact that like the way it's handled is very very star trek like um you have that bit of comedy you have that bit of kind of like fish out of water stuff this is certainly like what they when they do this episode they take the voy the voyage home takes notes from this then in terms of like the when they do the whole stuff back in time and um, and they're trying to fit in basically in, in a way like it kind of justifies how like kirk and spock kind of adapted very well because they this this isn't the first time they've done this they do travel back in time multiple times in the original series so they're used to this um but it still kind of gives them that chat that 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 uh, time to acclimatize um, so there's that lovely bit of ad-libbing or like improvising from them um, but then you also have like you know Spock is being very blunt in the way he's writing he's like because then he's a Vulcan legit he's, he's logical the only logical decision is he that she must die fuck your emotions essentially which is right he is absolutely correct in that um, so I think it's a positive writing I say like again the, the likes of Scotty and, 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 and Horror I think were written very tamely like very one dimensional but like they, they weren't in the show that long um, so I don't want to give away too much in that. Again, it's, ver it's, it's very clear they were only in it a, a short amount of time because he didn't even call him Scotty; called him Engineer. Yeah, and like, yeah, exactly. And yeah. and again, that they they tighten up on the di on the the language a good bit. Um, I suppose after this, because we're thinking like, you know, it's like we we see this as a 29th episode, but this isn't the 29th that was filmed. It was some way in the middle. So I'm thinking high again, Jerry. I yeah. I can see this being another nine. Honestly, I I will go in nine with you on on this as well. I thought yeah. the writing was fantastic. Um, the the you know obviously they had to make it Star Trek like because going with the original uh, uh, script or writing, it would have been far too dark. Especially the fact that um, he obviously you, you know because it's the first season of Star Trek, you can kind of you can kind of forgive him mm. for it. But it's a thing where if he was writing it nowadays and he and he's writing about the you know the Federation. And Starfleet executing one of their own, regardless of what they did. I'm like, no, that's a bit too much now. A bit too yeah. much there now, buddy. A bit too yeah, much exactly. there now. And the fact that he was selling drugs on the ship, that's a bit much now. So, yeah. Um, 
for me, for but me, that, that's, that's a different show then in that sense. Like, if they're oh, completely, yeah, completely. It's an episode onto itself. You, you, you know? could, you, you could, you know, you could almost see something like that in the likes of Stargate. Yes, the end of, because the start it, it, it's it's very uh, modern day. It's it's American uh, government, uh, American uh, Navy. Mm. Um, it's something that you could potentially see that you know humans aren't enlightened like they are in Star Trek, or they they yeah, claim yeah. They, they claim they are. You know that's yeah. the thing. But yeah, no. But, but, that, that, but, but that's what it is. Like they're not they're not the one looking to be the Boy Scouts either. They are, exactly, as you yeah. said, the Marines or soldiers. Yeah. They're not the 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 denizens of humanity like Starfleet pretend they are have to have to be. You know. Like if you were to tell fucking Colonel O'Neill, oh yeah, you're gonna have to be a diplomat here, he'll throw a grenade at it because that's his fucking type of diplomacy. And I can understand, I can respect that about Colonel O'Neill because I too sometimes want to just fucking throw a grenade and end them all one by one. But unfortunately, it doesn't work. Unfortunately, for the diplomacy, no. as far as I know. Um. So yeah, strong category for writing, and another strong category is the acting for me. And um, Jerry, this is your wheelhouse. <laughs> you must be in your element with this one. Um, for for me, there there are standouts. John Collins was actually fantastic in this, mm. absolutely fantastic. But I have to give the shout out. You know, uh, uh, Kirk was was good in in terms of the dilemma he had, uh, catching her coming down the stairs, catching her as she's going across the um as uh, the road, but then eventually catching McCoy as she's going across the road, and and she she gets knocked down. Uh, so, so Kirk and Spock were good in this episode, but for me, the, the standouts are John Collins, number one, mm. and and McCoy. Mm-hmm. McCoy was fantastic in this episode. I think probably the best of I've ever seen of McCoy. You know, it, you know, he actually. When you look at the grand scheme of things, when when you look at the movies, McCoy doesn't do an awful lot. You yeah, know, that's a good he point. Does, he doesn't do an awful lot. So, so to see him in this type of setting, act, actually able to use his acting chops. Was fucking brilliant. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, him and him and John Collins standouts for it. Uh, Spock was Spock. You know, you you don't get much better than Spock, and he does it so well. Uh, mm. Even the little bits of humor and all that he's putting in, I liked it. Kirk was again Kirk. Um, it, I think this would have been for me one of the first episodes that where you could really see a bit of overacting from from Shatner. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the other ones weren't actually that bad and we've discussed this and I'm saying uh, Kirk was actually okay in this Kirk was okay in this in this one the, the overacting was ever so slightly you could see it especially when he's talking about the dilemma of do I let her live or do I let her die the way he went on I'm like still good I, I, I people kind of give out about overacting I don't mind overacting I think it's you know it's it's a bit of fun you know that's 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 what it, what it is. Hmm. Um, like I see, you're trying to capture a lot, capture a lot in in one scene. Where like yeah. we're not appreciating that there are like hours and days between these scenes sometimes. Yeah, and yeah. that's the stuff we kind of forget. Like, as I said, like they went a week before McCoy arrives. So like you're condensing a week's worth of fucking character development and relationship development in half an hour, forty minutes. So yeah, like you, you, you are going to cut a bit of space to distance there by saying, okay, after five days, maybe Kirk is that enamored, enamored that he is gonna like ham it up in that scene. You know? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but I think I think this is a strong one uh, again. Uh, it's an eight or nine for me. Mm, I, I I will meet you at eight point five. Um, because I, I accept your point about the about about Kirk. Uh, to a certain respect, I think this is this is the type of episode where you do see the best of William Shatner, because it isn't about having up and having to sell something inanimate, if you know what I mean. Where like this isn't the Gorn situation where he has to fucking, like you know, act the wet slaps of fucking rubber he's getting hit with. This is something where like he is actively been given the premise he can, he, he doesn't have to bounce off anybody either. It is just like snap, go, person's died. And that's where that's where I think Shatner goes for it. The real star turn for me, and I, I agree with you with 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 with, um, with Keeler and with, with McCoy in a certain sense. And I will come back to this in a later category. Is the actual two the last two scenes where the deed is done and Kirk and Kirk is very visibly heartbroken, but because he is the stoic, he is the professional Starfleet captain that he has to be. It's a brave face. He can't show emotion. But you can see behind the eyes, he is devastated mm-hmm. because it isn't the same jovial Kirk we always see at the end of e- these episodes. He just wants to get out and move on, and yeah. and we'll we'll come back to that in the later scene. But I think that was the real start turn of the episode there for for, for acting. And um, next then it is action, and as we said, not a terribly active episode in that regard. Yeah. 
but effective in my view i think it gets a point across there is a bit of shenanigans with the policeman and and, and uh, stealing the uh seeing the clothes you have the 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 time ripples at the start that's reckoned the ship and sulu gets bonked you know there's, there's, a, there's a bit of action in here it's not too bad there there is a bit of action in here um you know it, yeah it's it's not like um i'm trying to think of an action-packed episode that we have like kind of like the last uh the the the, la- the season one finale of of uh stranger worlds it's not action-packed yeah. You know, but it has a little bit in it, and but it's a, it's justified. You know, it's it's it, it doesn't need this is an episode that doesn't need all the action, but unfortunately, it is a category that we have to uh, to score. Uh, we got the little bit, we got the little bit with McCoy um, going rabid, and that's literally what he is. He's rabid at the, at the start yeah. of it. Uh, he brings was, all that. He is the chaos. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, which I thought was good. Um, them trying to find him, it was fucking hilarious because he's right there. I'm like, Jesus Christ, put your glasses on, Scotty. <laughs> Um, even even him coming up behind the um, transporter chief and bonking him with a judo two judo chops. I'm like, yeah, judo chop. That was that was good. Um, but again, it's not an action packed episode. It can't. It, you just can't, can't mark be, yeah, a high. Exactly. You, can, you can't mark a high. But I'm not going to mark it like a two or a three. I'll go like five to a six. I had. Uh, seven in mind and the reason I say that is because again we're talking about how the episode flows as well and there is like there is a point where like did you have to go into a lull because they're turning it into a character show I, I think I'll go with 6.5 we'll meet in the middle Wait, we'll meet in the uh, middle and go 6.5 yeah 6.5 yeah because as I said like it, 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 it because they're doing a very character oriented episode here the story is taken over the right the characters are taken over the points that we're going to give in certain categories naturally are going to come out of this one because as I said, you're not putting in a bombastic like um, mm-hmm. set piece each time. You can't. You just don't have time for it, and it's not going to fit. I think, as I said, the the McCoy fr- uh, frenzies and the little bits and pieces in between. I think they they, they serve the episode well. Again, six point five is it, it looks like a bad score in the context of all the other ones, but just look how good the other categories are. Like they, like this is an exemplary episode in certain equations, you know. Um, much to that point. Um, the effects now again we're talking original series we're talking the 1960s here how what the, can they do to get the point across uh, in terms of visual and audio effects um, and again we, we a lot of the points we've kind of said about setting some of them will apply to the, the effects as well I liked the the cortisone like almost like a, almost like a rash on McCoy's face and how it evolves over the time like by the time that he is like uh, when he appears essentially in uh, in New York, he is fully under it and he looks completely diseased. Like someone like Ida Killer looking at that will think he's poxmarked by the way he is. And I think he just and it's the it's to me it's the it's the pink around the eyes. He just looks like raw, like raw and under it, and um, very physically unwell looking. And I think again it's a small thing, but it but even though the, the arm that the arms the hands are done the same way and they're clearing up as he get and he's as he's recovering small things like that it's it, it sounds stupid but like they do need to be done um because we need a bit of visual language to say oh he actually yeah. is he's still under the frenzy whatever it is yeah um, i think overall I, I i did love the the contraption the like uh spock's contraption just the more more added on to it the vacuum tubes popping and all this sort of stuff yeah. and there's more and more just being stacked along the way i i did enjoy that i really really did yeah and to be honest with you good use of archive footage as well for them i, I thought so yeah for for yeah. for obviously there was clearly a couple of uh maybe 30s or 40s movies black and white movies yeah, uh, you know that was good. You could see the Romans and the Egyptian, uh, Egyptians, I should say. Yeah, and and, and things like that. Uh, it, in terms of effects, you know, I'm going to go all the way back to the start where you've got the the ship is rocking. You know, of something is is affecting the ship. You've got Sulu's console explodes in his face. I'm like, that was actually quite good. That was yeah, actually yeah, really, for the really time, good. That, that, that yeah. does that does cost a bit to do it. Yeah. You've got yeah. you, you've got obviously the Cordazine um, injection going into McCoy and him going batshit crazy, which was great. I thought the Guardian Forever was very good. I um, liked the way it looked. So, like as it, yeah. simple as a couple of smoke machines on the other side of it and blowing the smoke down. I'm like, that's actually not bad. You know what I mean? Listen, we're not talking about you know Star Trek Discovery or or or, or Picard season three graphics here. You know, it 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 was it's 
the 1960s at the end of the day, but I think they did a pretty good job with what they had. Uh, in terms of scoring, I would... I'd probably go a seven. Yep, I, I, I yeah. agree with you on seven, I think. Yeah, I think that's yeah. that's a fair score. Like, I don't think there's anything I can really take away from it in Grand Theft like, oh, that it looks a bit weird. Like, in fairness, with the different lighting and the and and, the, and away from the kind of the, 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 the Enterprise kind of lighting, Spock's kind of like yellowish skin does it, look it, a bit, it, it's a it's, bit uncanny, yeah, it, but, it's, yeah, it's very, when you compare him, that was one thing I did notice, is that when you compare him to Edith Keller and to Kirk, he is very made up with makeup. Like yeah. it, it, it's it's caked on. Whereas we're also Kirk, seeing the HD version of the show now as well. Exactly. So all of that is being shown up. Yeah. So so yeah. We when when, when you're looking at Kirk, he he, he kind of looked like he had no makeup on compared to Spock because it was so caked on to Spock's face. So you do you'd have to take points away from that. But I think seven is a fair score for that. I think yep. it's uh, the, the the effects were good for the time. I, I really liked the Guardian Forever because of the the way it looked, the, the lights illuminating from inside. And then the smoke machines on the back are, I think, are, 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 are fantastic as well. So, yeah, I think seven's a good score. You mentioned that earlier on, and it's now kind of stuck in my head. This is a Stargate done in 1960 without the CGI, without this, without the extra kind of computer uh, uh, impact, because it is hard to like when, you, when we see it in Discovery. That is what it's intended to be. You can, like you know, it's the it's the it is a Stargate kind of gimmick in a sense, but in a, in a very kind of roundabout way. Like the Guardian Forever in very clearly inspires the Stargate, and the Stargate very clearly inspires Discovery to do the Guardian Forever again. And yeah. it's a lovely little thing. I love little things like that in Star in, in sci-fi where it just self-references itself. I just oh I love it. I love it. Um so we have our last four categories, and uh again, we're talking strong here. Um I have the most positives in this category of score. Um oh. again, we we talk about like having to use music smartly when you're at this time of uh of star trek and i think tactically they nailed it again there's a lot of quiet parts of the episode not everything needs to sting not even everything needs to swell um, and they have to pick their battles but when they do put in the music it's absolutely perfect and again a lot of unique stuff for this episode too yeah. which i always get points for and mm -hmm. um, but you're a score man jerry you tell me how did the music hit you today the uh, the original series kind of suffers from having the same music constantly. Mm -hmm. um, that was not this episode. It was not. And I, I, it's very simple for me. This is a ten. You're going for ten. Okay. This is a ten. For the simple fact is, you've got that. You go straight into the episode, and, you're, da, 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 and I'm like, oh, this is different. And then that's a, that's a that is a team all the way through it. Until we start to come to the comedic episodes, so it's a little bit lighthearted, do, 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 do. and then a do, 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 do. and then eventually it comes to the the truck, do, 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 do. Do, do, do. and then it, it then it, we we go back to the planet and it ends. So the music was absolutely on point. The music was fantastic. There were some quiet, there were some quiet moments, but this is the thing about Star Trek and that's specifically Star Trek does mm. it need music every second of, not all the of time, every no. scene it just doesn't need it it needs it for the big moments it needs it for those like climactic uh, happenings of, of what Star Trek is and it, it, it delivered in this absolutely for me 10 out of 10 mm. anyway, like, it, it, it's like with every other movie like the Lord of the Rings doesn't have a constant three hour score going through the whole thing it feels like it does that's because we remember the high notes we remember mm. the music swelling up as as we re arrive into mm. somewhere fucking like uh, huge and great and graceful or it's a huge battle about to start you hear the swell you get the adrenaline run you get the fucking you, you can hear the drums whereas like any and the same with any other movie you can see the same with game of thrones with any any good like uh game or fucking tv show or movie that you can think of that has a score you know remember when the music kicks in you don't necessarily have to remember it being there the whole time because your brain will automatically populate it it'll tell you oh the music was here and it'll fill the blanks in for you and that's what that's what as i said like that's what the same with, with star trek was with star wars and anything like the immediate when you think of star wars you got the imperial march or you got the fucking the battle with uh with, with Darth maul those are the two first pieces of music that comes in my, my mind with with star du wars du imperial Anything. march and duel of defeats Duel of the Fates. Thank you, Jerry. I couldn't remember the name off the top of my head. But like the Duel of the Fates, the first thing that comes to my mind is the na 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 na. I don't. No matter what scene that's in, it's in there. That's all it is. Yeah. 
you know, and it's the same with, with a lot of like um a lot a lot of like in, uh, like orchestral scores like that is that it's in your head, you place it wherever you want to, and so forth. You don't remember the quiet bits because, as I said, they're the points that are, you, you know they're irrelevant. It doesn't matter. You just skip along, listen to the show the episodes, catch what's going on in the in the in the, in the plot, and pay attention, and that's it. And um, so yeah, I agree with ten. I I, I genuinely think the actual use of music here was actually tremendous. Um, because like I said, they did they do they were consistent with what they do in the original series. Like when the Vulcan nerve pinch is happening, it's the you have the high violin shrill. When McCoy is uh, is is hallucinating, it's the same kind of shrill, but it's it's a frenzy. It's it's yeah. different. It's different from what they're doing. They they knew um, what they were doing with this episode anyway. They, they knew did. what they were doing. They, they absolutely did. Um, and again, here's a good point actually, because we, because uh, remember, I take I took points away from Little Green Men for for doing less with the score when they could have done more. This is how you do it. It's like it's it, yeah. it's a climbing of it. This the city in the edge of forever deals more with the less than what they had. Little Green Men did with more, um, and and that's a that's a key thing there. Next up then is scenes. Um, so like again, there's a lot of I wouldn't say there is necessary iconic scenes in this, but with very very important in the episode scenes and yeah i think like I, I, again I, I love the i have been taking putting points in this into different categories here for this one but the dynamic between when they're when they do the fish out of water scenes where they're trying to improvise a way out with the policeman that is just a wonderful dynamic between kirk and spock it's just fabulous it is that like particular level of hijinks i think the three the, the two scenes that really really stand out for me at the end are the last two I think like the episode really does build up to that. But what I would say about it is, and I don't, I didn't really appreciate it until I watched it back, is that how sudden it is. You know, it comes across initially as just like, oh, we're out of time of the episode, let's wrap this up. But actually, that's kind of, it is a little bit what's going on. But you could also argue it's like, oh no, Kirk doesn't know when this is happening, and now suddenly everything's out of control. Like he 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 has tried, he saved her on the stairs. He's like she's walk. He's walking her across the the road to avoid traffic, and then suddenly, McCoy, fuck, there he is. He's across the road. Stay here, and immediately he's uh, he's out of he's out of control for two minutes, and all hell breaks loose. And it is solely that the 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 panicked way that scene starts is excellent because you think the scene is going to start out normally. They're going to have a nice bit of dialogue, a bit of back and forth between them, and then suddenly she's dead in like within the minute. Absolutely well done. Um. Mm -hmm. It's a very good example, and it's a very, it's so hard to pull it off because you just kind of like you, you just assume that they kind of shit the bed and, and do it too quickly, of pacing an episode to go at, or pacing a scene to go out of control, and um, and they really really did that. It's so hard to do, but they did it, and um, and then the last scene, the last scene when they're when they're back from the garden forever and Scotty and her are trying to figure out what the fuck happened over there because like the the mood is flat. Like there's no banter between the three lads, which is the first time I've ever seen that in the original series. I'm sure there's been one or two more examples, but I do not remember when it's completely flat zero, no conversation, no chatter, and it's all in the. It's all for me is in Shatner's eyes. It's all the I can't tell the crew what happened. I'm heartbroken. They cannot know, and it's just let's get the hell out of here. And yeah. it's just it's excellent. It's absolutely tremendous. Um. I think, especially because in the end, the episode was building towards those two scenes. There was an inevitability to it. Kirk knew it. Everyone else knew it, but it is, they didn't want to admit it. And I, and I really, really love that. Um, I'm scoring high. I'm going to say possibly an eight to a nine. Um, I'm going to I'm going to pick three scenes myself. I'm going to go with the two that you said. So the yeah. last two scenes, basically, of of him racing across the road and her going, "What's going on?" and bang, gets hit by a truck. Um, I thought that that scene was particularly good. The fact that the the, the standout for me was the point where McCoy is like, "You you stopped me. Why did you stop me?" And that line, ah, it was fa fantastic. Then obviously the end scene um, is it's almost haunting because yes. the, look, the look in 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 Kirk's eyes, you know, he's just lost in in his in his eyes at that point. Uh, the probably the the love of his life. Even though the fact that he only knew her for a fucking week, but whatever. Mm. Um, but that again, it's it is it's haunting. It's the look in his eyes is like I can never talk about this. It, it, let's just get the fuck out of here, and, and I never want to come back to this place again. But there's one more scene, and I'm like, I think the the the, the chops go to McCoy with this one. Um, D. Forrest Kelly was fantastic in this. Is that when he first comes over, 
um, when he first comes through the, the the Guardian, and he's chasing that poor guy who's robbing the milk. Yes. And he gets him oh, and he's on, I feel and, so and he, bad for him. Yeah, and and he's on his he's on his knees. Yeah. Uh, and McCoy is kind of deranged, and I thought McCoy was fantastic in this in this was, particular was. scene. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I'll go. I tell you what, I'll go eight. I'll okay. Go eight on this. So you did eight on it, so we'll go eight. I'll go with eight. Yeah. I say he just remind me how how sorry I felt for that for that poor unfortunate soul. Like I know he's even called Roden in the script. I even feel sorry for him for that. Roden. But he was he he was underrated in this episode as well. Again, as as a step in, as a as a, as a as a guest star, he just plays it so well because like he's there like kind of like you know panning it up with 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 Kirk and McCoy a little bit or Kirk and Spock even not not the friends at all. It is very opportunistic. It's like oh, if you show weakness, I'm gonna I'm gonna take something off you, you know, which is natural. And um, and then like the one time where he's like oh, I'm gonna get this glass of milk, he's probably done it countless times over the night over over nights and weeks. But this one time, some crazy man shows up and you can see the. The actual proper shaking like he is yeah. shaking and i you, you just feel so sorry for him because like because like i said they're just he's just trying to get by he doesn't want crazy in his life he just wants to survive and then suddenly he's just like he's in, he's encountering this madman on drugs and he doesn't know how to handle it you know he's he's, he's genuinely petrified he's so vulnerable and just just for that alone like fuck i feel like i feel like having to reassess the, the acting score but no i won't but like it just I, it, those scenes there. You remind me of how well those of them did for being in their own their own headspace, and and that was and that was excellent. So I think eight is a fair score. Um, then we got the character, and uh, again, I suppose like the kind of the misnomer is that like it's uh, it, it, it McCoy is the is the outlier here in this in this whole category. I'm not I'm not marking them negative. The only negative I do actually have is probably Uhura being like the damn like playing a damsel in distress when she is only in for the one scene. It's like, I'm scared, Captain. It's like, you're a lieutenant. You know, chin up. Like, it's going to be fine. You need to find a solution to this. <laughs> Compared to what she is like in Strange New Worlds, it's like, where have you, where is your fucking backbone gone over? Come on, set up the fuck, you know? Remember, I didn't die for this. Um, so, like, y- y- when you look at then, like, that, that's a one blemish on this one. But overall, it's a strong category for me. I do like the Eva Killer character. And... Um, Usually, I will. I hate the trope of the of the forward-looking person and so forth, but um, but she's the first one of this arc. Like she is actually the the, the basis of all those characters going forward of the forward-looking um, characters. You know, because we get it, we get the same again in the vo- in the voyage home with the uh, the whale scientist, mm. and she's a similar character in a sense, but she's cooler. She's not uh, a sancti- She's not as like you know sanctimonious about it or whatever it is she like she's very direct and say no no i i care about these this one thing in particular which is fine and so every other character that is of that same archetype is now based off her and and we're for good reason like she's actually probably the most well-rounded of the lot you know like she is very it's not only because like it's not just like you know sarah silverman in a fucking in in an observatory like reading comic books that this is not what this is this is someone who is actively trying to help people in need so she's living the philosophy she's not just talking about oh i wish we could see aliens it's like no no she is forward thinking she is trying to make a better future for these kids for these people and I, I, and that's something that kirk appreciates again the kirk and spock are the, the the standout winners in this episode for me they're actual as a double act they are on par with fucking Markham and Wise. Like, <laughs> honestly, God, like they, they, it, it, it is the the typical kind of like unintentional comedy of it all. But it's it's in a very weird phrase, it's intentional unintentional comedy from them. You know, they know what they're doing. They know it's a, it's like they, they their level of teamwork goes beyond you know um, anyone else at that stage. Or like Kirk will pick up on a bit of ad libbing, and even Spock, despite his Vulcan nature. Is picking up on what Kirk is saying, and he's uh, and he's like adding on to it or letting into it, and some of the lines that come out with is fucking hilarious. Like the, like Spock giving yeah. out about yeah. not having to, the, the tools to do the job, or like you know like stealing the clockwork stuff. is like I need it for my hobby. It was like, I mean, I can't argue with that, <laughs> you know. But I, I think overall a fantastic episode, and it's also and uh, a very important note as well about Kirk and and. We've probably mentioned this before, but I, don't, I think this is only the first time it's come up about Kirk's actual conquests. Is that like you always like? I think the joke is that Kirk is a bit of a is is, is a bit of a fuckboy in space, um, and 
a bit. But when you, as I, from from someone who's watched the original series, he actually really isn't. He's a, like he is a very by the book Starfleet officer. I think we all it, it, it's because like because this was written in the sixties, and I I am only slightly exaggerating here, folks. Gonna say literally everyone was fucking in the nineteen sixties. You know they're like they're the the inhibitions and the. The, shall we say the kind of the, the rules had relaxed so much on TV that there was literally just sex, drugs, and rock and roll on TV, and it looks so tame now compared to what we have. But like again, look, the the standards and values at the time were so different. The fifties and how reserved and rhetoric and fucking family values, blah. Then suddenly you get to the sixties where everyone's wearing colors and writing like there's no tomorrow because it was a cultural thing. They thought there was going to be a nuclear war the next day. They had no fucking time for, for inhibitions. They wanted to shag now, and I respect that about them. Um, but like, <laughs> but then, but that also reflects then on the on the TV that was out. You know, like er, like you were, you had swashbucklers in charge of things, um, like a spaceship. So Kirk is a swashbuckler. He is reckless. He is a fool at the best of times, and he has a lot of conquests. Uh, mm. All of them are consensual. Um, mm. There's one that is definitely a yikes. But that's just a horrendous episode in its own right. <laughs> Out of all the ones, this is the one where you feel like it's not a physical attraction; it is an emotional connection with this person, um, and and I think that's what hurts the most. Because again, like we we know that like he has a son with Carol Marcus, you know, at, at this stage of his life that delicately is is not spoken about until the Wrath of Khan. Um, but yeah, but he finally meets someone who he actually thinks, oh, actually, you have found my soul. We potentially have found my soulmate, someone who I, I I want to share my life with, and it's the most impossible circumstances. Like, there's no way he could make this work. He can't even bring her back it through time with him because the timeline is irrevocably fucked. So he can't do it. Um, and that conundrum, I think, it, it didn't really get like kind of like delved upon because that was never considered as an option. But hmm. it could have been. You know, he could have thought about it, and maybe he did. Um, what would you character for yourself, Jerry? Like, where would you like? You, you were a big fan of McCoy in this one, so perhaps but, like uh, McCoy is yeah. my number. My McCoy is my number one for this. Um, obviously, yeah. uh, Edith, uh, Spock, and, and Kirk played the roles really well. They were a little bit fleshed out in this episode, but for me, you, as I said, we don't really get to see much of McCoy other than he's dead, Jim, or I'm a doctor, not a fucking barman or whatever you know that's yeah. how, it's the type of thing you would say so you don't really get to see um, McCoy as fleshed out uh, the only time we got to see him a little bit more fleshed out I think was the search for Spock um, because he has Spock's memories and stuff like that so it's the oh, only yeah, time and, and um, the, the final frontier when he's reliving his um, his dad's um, final days that's yeah. when you actually yeah. get to see him act so yes. yeah it's a good point so this, yeah. this this is in my memory anyway and I, I haven't watched all of the original series so I don't know but he, he, he was very much he was using the action chops in this he was fucking exceptionally good from mm. being direct, you know being a norm I'm a doctor not this I'm like yeah good lad and then all of a sudden he injects himself with the fucking uh, with the cortisine cortisine yeah cortisine and he just goes absolutely bananas the the Crazy uh, McCoy is actually fantastic. It's uh, really, really mm. good. Um, to the scene on the planet on, on Earth when he gets there, to even when he's starting to get better and he's flirting with with Edith, you're like, fuck this, this dirty bollocks. Yeah, very, very good. Um, yeah. But you know, you you can't really say anything bad about any of them. Really, they they were all exceptionally good. Um, John Collins was fucking great, just absolutely brilliant. Um, I'd go. Eight. Yep, I think eight is fair. Um, eight was what I had in mind myself. So yeah, I think um, I think eight is a fair score there. So then we move on to the consequences. Um, so Jerry, what are the major consequences of this episode? I don't know. That's that, that's mm. something because I've never seen this before. Generally, when when I get asked this question about this particular category, I've watched the episode before and I know what to say. But for this one, I just don't know. I. Are there? I, I, okay, I know the Guardian appears again in in Discovery, but it, it's that's not a consequence of this episode, mm. uh, other than the fact that it was in this episode. So I don't really know. What are your thoughts? So I, I think I think there's like there's two levels to to kind of read this episode on for me. Like the first episode is a kind of the 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 the, the kayfabe one that says like how does it affect the characters individually, and unfortunately this is where like we'll lose points in this category because. 
because this is episodic and there everything is essentially an island to itself we don't really we don't hear of either keeler or the guardian forever ever again until star trek discovery so we don't see like uh, kirk being like gun shy with other conquests he will try he will meet somebody in a, in a couple of episodes time because that's just the way things were written that's the way things were produced and um, as i said like this episode is like was it was put out as a 29th episode but it was probably produced some way beforehand and, and other stuff basically skipped and went back and back and forth in the queue so it, 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 i can't it depends on which way you want to judge that just from the nature of the show at the time and trying to find their feet whether that's a that's a blemish on their on, on their score here but then i'm also thinking on a more of like production point of view like this is their actual I want to say this is their pro- first proper time travel episode, and it's it's a blueprint that they're going to follow for for quite some time. I would say, in terms of of this, like again, the more you look at it, this is like the voyage home is a comedy equivalent of this um of this uh, episode for me. Mm. Um, it's when they're, they're kind of taking out the 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 the, the, the sub commentary is there, hundred percent. Yeah, but it's not to the same extent where like they're talking about wow, drugs are bad, wow, corruption and and, and pollution and blah 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 blah. It's more light hearted. It's it's it, it's more a bit of it's a bit of fun. Yeah. Um, and I'm just even just checking here from the episodes that I'm aware of, and I believe yes, this is the first time travel episode that they do. Um, so it's completely it's completely uncharted territory in that sense but I think it it starts off on the point of like it gets the story beats across you have the Starfleet people completely like um, trying to find their feet have no idea how to integrate into this like ancient society by their mm-hmm. stretch of the imagination so when you have now that you have the city on the edge of forever the next generation has time's arrow that's the that would be the equivalent where like the, the 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 crew are trying to like they take the guise of an acting troupe which is absolutely hilarious and um, then you have um past tense which is an excellent version of this in from these phase nine where again it's the same thing where like cisco has to basically go into a deprived area and try and like get everybody out essentially and then you have in voyager with the episode of reference earlier on that i can't remember um the two-parter set in san francisco you know the one i'm talking about i just can't remember the name oh of uh yeah the doctor got his mobile emitter um yes i keep saying i don't uh, I, don't I don't know the name of it yeah I, i'll have to check this there it'll, it'll, it'll pop it to my head eventually um enterprise didn't quite how it, it kind of had the double header where you had the alternate um history nazis that was dog shit to be honest we don't need yeah. to talk about that um but the point is the actual the precedence for time travel episodes are set up but then you've also got butterfly effect episodes too mm-hmm. and that's a key thing that this episode is is open the door for both types futures end is the voyagers episode i was thinking of um so like it, it's set it's setting up that you had um a butterfly effect episode so another equivalent with this would be yesterday's enterprise that's butterfly effect um a quality of mercy which you watched last, watched last time out that's a butterfly effect that wouldn't have happened without this episode so yeah uh, yeah a lot of firsts are this um are with this episode that ends up becoming a, a kind of a trope and a staple both in in star trek but science fiction generally yeah and um, so i think it's an important episode from that point and i'm also kind okay. of balancing it with the with the non-canon one so six to seven seven i'll go six and a half six and a half okay okay six and a half and um, okay that leads us with an interesting score so um okay interesting right let me just put it in the in the rank and file and let's see where we get it for we get it to uh, bu- 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 bu. Oh, this is all the exciting parts yes 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 you can stop fighting okay here we go so um so you're gonna see the full um, list coming out on um, on the uh, screen right now. However, to save Jerry Soul the hassle of hearing all the 29 episodes again, the city on the edge of forever is not our most ranked, our best ranked original series episode. It started off strong, but as I said, it was uh, mm. it was a few things kind of let it down in the end. Amok Time is still standing as our best episode from the from that time uh, with 88. However, it is now the second best episode from the original series and 10th overall 
with a score of 82.5. That's the good score, I think. Yep. So it is currently, I suppose, like in the realm, it is currently better than Family from the next generation. Um, the double header of The Balance of Terror and The Trouble with Tribbles, Cupid, and Q Who from the next generation. So that's what it's beating. Uh, it is slotting just underneath. Actually, I might as well give you the top 10 over here. So obviously, the family's been dislodged. It's now 11th. So we have the City in Danger Forever, now sitting at 10th. The Skin of Evil and the Andorian Incident, um, Next Generation and Enterprise, respectively, both 83, joint 8th place. No small parts, uh, bumped down, down to 7th, uh, alongside The Visitor from Deep Space Nine, both 83.5. Emissary, the double header uh, debut of Deep Space Nine, that's 84. Uh, fourth place now is Amok Time, the original series classic from uh, on, on 88 points. Best of both worlds, currently third and 90.5, and our joint leaders of In the Pale Moonlight and Equality of Mercy from Strange New World at 91 out of a possible hundreds. The rest of the uh, episodes that we have done over the series are all available on screen there. So if you recognize a few, by all means, give it out to us in the comments if you think uh, we got the score wrong for some of them. <laughs> but like I said, 82.5 is a very, very good score um, for this episode. Um, considering, like I said, we're, we're trying to factor in like what things they could have done better. It's an absolutely tremendous episode one way or another. I think it, it excels in certain categories somewhat. Like if I could give an 11 to plot, I would. Oh, um, and yeah. this is an, a, a brilliant premise and a brilliant hypothetical. Um, and like I said, if we're trying to be consistent, this is where some of the scorings will, will have to let us down here in a sense. But either way, I think it's I think it's a good score. I think it's a fair one. And uh, I'm happy out. I think uh, I think we yeah. did this episode justice, really. I think so, so too, yeah. 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 All right, then. So... So then we uh, we asked ourselves then with the original series back in the books, we have done another episode of it and Jerry's slow integration into um, 1960s Star Trek uh, will continue until the next arc. But we are moving on then to our next time travel adventure. And I'm sure you're setting the pattern now here, folks, at this stage. We, well, d 9 was the outlier because we wanted to ease ourselves into this uh, arc of, uh, of Kraken episodes. But we've done Strange New Worlds. We now have done the original series. So now we move on to the next generation which we haven't done in quite some time Jerry mm -hmm. and this could be a top tier contender as well if this is my personal pick to upset the apple cart and um, because our next time you want me episodes on this series is yesterday's enterprise <laughs> an episode that if if there was a time and space for it at the time this would have been the first feature film of the Enterprise D era. This was actually initially this the, this concept start off started off as the first feature film of the uh, Next Generation, but wow. of course they never got around to it and did the episode instead. But this would have been the concept. This is what they would have done for the first Next Generation movie. It becomes an episode themselves, and in my view, any like I think any premise that's good enough to be a movie is already a strong episode. So yeah. I think it's strong. It's starting off strong there. But like I said, we are going to do it to do, do the due diligence. We're going to review the episode and see if it'll challenge um, the top spot of uh, well, could it make it a three? Could it make it a three-way uh, leaders? We don't know. Could it could do better? Could it do worse? We'll have I, to wait. To I, see. I I'm going to make a prediction. Okay. For for that episode, because if I think about it now, and I think about the scoring, mm -hmm. and how it could be scored, I think. That when we finish reviewing that, we will have a new leader. Um, I think it's all but guaranteed. It, it is possible. It is certainly certainly possible. Um, I t I think I because we're without getting into too much detail. It ticks the boxes of every mm. single category, every, and and we're not talking about one or two, every single category mm. oh ho, ho. I've, I had I, you know what because I, we, we obviously we talk about stuff off off, off air and, yeah. and I had completely forgotten about this one because I thought the next one was going to be the one I thought the next one was going to be Voyager and it was going to be the one that was going to upset as you say upset the upper card. Yes. Um that would be the year of hell by the way I, 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 th I think the year from hell is going to be a high, highly scored as well, but I don't. I think I think we're going to have a new leader after the next episode, and I think that's going to be 
it may have a Roman Reigns esque run. <laughs> Possibly, we have to score first and see where it goes. Okay. Well, you know I, I, mean? I, I'm just thinking about it now. Going, oh, oh fuck! <laughs> 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 you know, you, you look at you look at some good episodes. Yeah, and and the one I'm not going to say which one, but it's a, a double header Deep Space Nine action packed episode. You know that I said to myself, Jesus, that could get all tense. But when you mm. actually really look into it, there's one particular character category. I'm like, mm, it may not. You know, I don't know. It probably we'll probably get nineties. Yeah, um, but whether it would would go high enough to beat everything else, I don't know. But my Jesus, yes, there's a oh my god. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, we're excited. Now. Well, I, 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 all I can say is, uh, you know what? Uh, in the pale moonlight, had a great run. Um, can you learn to we, live with it, Jerry. If it does get upset for the top spot, I can actually, uh, mm. because it is. It's probably the next episode. Again, without going into it, it's probably one of the best next gen episodes there is. Yeah. Uh, because it has a little bit of everything. Um, I do mean everything from from writing to plot to acting to music to uh, con- like consequences. Like my God, consequences! <laughs> what would this what this potentially be? Top marks episode. I yes. Think if we got a full hundred episodes, I think we have to stop the series because it does. I don't think there's any top in it. Like we'd, we'd like we'd be done. We'd have to move on to something else. Like we do have to leave a little bit on the table, don't we? Like, I we, don't know because I'm. Wrong. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm just thinking about that episode now. I'm like, yeah, I'd give a ten for that. Yeah, I'd give a ten for that. Yeah, I'd give a ten for that. Give a ten for that. Give a ten for that. I'm like, oh, f- I can't. Mm. I, well, obviously, we're going to have to watch it. Yes. But I, right now, I can't think of anything that would sco- score below a nine or a ten. Yeah, that's saying it, it, this 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 is the brass tacks we're dealing with here now. And again, we're we're dealing with top tier episodes from this point on, or at least interesting episodes in that regard. Um, so yeah, look, we'll we'll get to it um next time out when we're on the best of all world show, and uh, and we'll see if it does indeed live up to the top bidding, or will it will it will it surprise us, and and we'll find chinks in the armor. We'll wait and see. Um, but that is for for next time. That is for the 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 next uh, time portal that that flops out of from the space time continuum thingy, BJ. Um, so in any case um, Jerry as always thank you very much for joining me tonight always a pleasure talking to you pleasure. what is happening in the magic world of Jerry's soul as we mentioned last time you were about to host Dublin Comic Con you, you have now host Dublin Comic Con uh, plenty uh, plenty uh, uh, times away uh, as it's uh, as going out mm-hmm. um, what else is happening in the in the magical world of Jerry's soul at the moment um, well obviously I, I hosted Comic Con which was, which was a huge treat for me um, I got to meet some uh, amazing actors. Uh, one being um, Star Trek's Christina Chong, who was mental, uh, who who was, was absolutely a, who absolutely uh, batshit crazy. Yeah, uh, but I mean that in the nicest way possible because she is so fucking nice. Yeah, she's um, absolutely like she she obviously we we couldn't talk about Star Trek because of the sag Astra site, which you know it was the one it was the one interview that I was. I was I was nervous about because I'm like shit. What do I talk to her about if I can't talk mm. to her about Star Trek? And of course, you know, listen. When it came to when it came to end every single one of the actors, we checked with them. We checked with their uh, agents, make sure what we could and could not talk about. I talked to her multiple times. I was like, can I mention this? Can I mention this? She was like, no, no, no. I was like, there was never an issue, never mm. an issue whatsoever. But we we did talk about her new music career, which she's doing now. Um, she's actually quite quite a good singer, which I, I was quite surprised about. Um, she we talked we talked about her background in, in um, uh, musicals and and singing and dancing and how her her life changed when she got injured um, uh, while on stage, and um, and and then she went in full blown into acting after that. Um, she was so so nice, and she she wanted to play a couple of her songs for the audience, which she did. And uh, she then decided to to uh, do a, a a house remix of one of her songs, and got me up to dance. <laughs> got me up to dance, which was magical, now, by the way. I was watching which, it live. Which, which, which was magical. Um, and I actually said uh, during the, the the live segment, "Please don't tell my wife," is is what I said because if she sees me dancing, then she'll think I can dance, 
and then she'll want to dance with me then after that. So I was like, please don't tell my wife. Oh, hell, right. So, yeah. Exactly. Uh, sh- the, 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 the rest of uh, Comic Con went uh, amazing. I did the, uh, I hosted the cosplay competition as well, which was a little bit of a clusterfuck. If I if I'm honest, because as uh, expected, yeah, we, we we went through all the the costumes, and there was a few hiccups with regards to judging and to scoring and stuff like that. But I do genuinely believe the three people who came first, second, and third, rightfully so, uh, came first, second, and third. The winner being a uh, a young a young boy. I think he was maybe twelve or thirteen, yeah. who had completely made his own predator costume from top to bottom all by himself and i was like that that is exactly what this competition is for um and and he was he was absolutely amazing he was fantastic um and he was very 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 gracious he he, he said can i ring my dad to tell him that i've i've won i'm like you do what you want buddy <laughs> you do what yeah. you want so he rang his dad his dad was delighted so it was it, it, it was absolutely fantastic uh one other thing is uh that i have taken on a second job uh at mm-hmm. the minute so for for all you um history buffs and for all you horror fans, uh, if you decide that you would like to, if you're in and around Dublin, and you'd like to do something new and something different, uh, come on to the uh, Hidden Dublin Walks and Tours bus, which is the uh, Gravedigger bus, uh, or the Ghost Bus Tour, uh, that sets out from uh, Abbey Street, uh, not Abbey Street, Dame Street, um, Fridays and Saturday evenings. And then we're coming into October now, so... Um, It'll be on. There'll be two tours a day for the for the month of October. A uh, very very busy time for us. Um, but it's fun. Uh, you get a few scares and you learn something, you know. And right near the end, if you're over 18s, you you get to go into the Grave Diggers Cavernous Pub up at um, Glass Nevin and have a pint of what I believe, and it's arguably uh, the best pint of Guinness in Ireland. Yeah, it's a it's a strong show. It's a real fucking strong show. Uh, and again, you know your Guinness. I'll take your word for it uh, more than anyone else's. So, um, so yeah. Um, so that's what's happening with Jerry Soul. You don't give a flying shit about what happens to me because you're sick to death of me on this channel as it is. So I shall not um, divulge any more further than that. Just, just keep watching Nerds of Us is all I can ask you to do. Keep yep. supporting the channel. Um, we greatly appreciate everyone who, who tuned in for the last episode and have been watching all the ones back. Um, so greatly appreciate on that. Thank you very much for your support. And uh, again, by all means, uh, talk to us in the comments. Let us know if you agree with our score. Were we too harsh? Were we... Uh, were we too generous on the scoring for this episode let me know let us know in the comments indeed and exactly. uh, and, and we'll start up a conversation and again we're coming up to the end of this time mark so we are going to need ideas and prompts for our next set so by all means if you think you've got something that we're going to get our, our teeth sunk into tell us in the comments and we will do so and um, because like i said uh th- this is a this is a good time for star trek at the moment um, but all the good things do come to an end, as a, a certain uh, omnipotent being does say. In any case, um, Jerry, as ever, it's been a pleasure, and we are going to sign off as we always do on this show with a very important message from your Vulcan friends. <laughs> Thank you.